Hello, Internet, and welcome to episode four of On War the Podcast. My name is Alastair, and I'm joined once again by my good friend and co host Austin. And in this episode, we're discussing peacekeeping, a not war that nevertheless constitutes political violence in the modern world. Yeah, so over the next coming weeks, uh, we're going to be looking at a, a couple of things. The first one we're looking at this week, obviously, is peacekeeping, um, peacekeeping deployments and and those as, as sort of not wars. And then in two weeks' time, we're going to be looking at insurgencies and how those evolve. And then later on, we're going to be uh, looking at terrorism, which is going to be a happy, fun subject. But uh, for now, we're looking at sort of peacekeeping and, and how we use that as a defense or, or how that's used in the international community as a justification for the deployment of armed force, and whether or not that constitutes a conflict or a war, or whether it's case-dependent. So I guess, broadly defined, peacekeeping is a technique of, of preserving the peace in a post-conflict environment that's traditionally concerned with primarily military deployments. In sort of the last 15, 20 years, it's been diversified to include uh, police and civilian specialists as well. And the whole effort is to do just a little bit more than hold the armies apart. Um, it's a pretty normative approach. It, it's based in liberalism, uh, as we discussed a few weeks ago, and, and draws its legitimacy from the UN Charter and the acceptance in the international world sphere of the UN Charter as a, a sort of guiding norm in international relations, uh, specifically for anyone who's interested uh, chapter 6 and Chapter 7 of the Charter, which I'm not going to recite. You guys can look up. So peacekeeping's sort of had a long history, hasn't it? It has. And the modern peacekeeping really starts post-World War II. But if you look at what its goal is, and really, as, as Alistair pointed out, what it's doing is it's creating space for diplomatic efforts to occur and creating that normative environment. That's been around for a lot longer. We just haven't called it that. Armed intervention in order to establish peace was something that colonial governments used to do quite a lot. Even the British and India used to do so to keep rival groups apart. In terms of modern peacekeeping, what we look at now, it first started post-World War II. The, the first major, what we call a peace enforcement conflict, is obviously the Korean War, which we'll talk about later. But we do have some pretty long-running missions that are still going. Uh, the Golan Heights observation um, that's been going since the end of the Seven Years' War, for instance, is still ongoing, and Australian forces have contributed to that, which is an effectively a, an observation mission. I think as we go further along, however, we're seeing a trend away from that initial unarmed observation style to a much more militarised response that is more willing to put soldiers at risk in order to protect civilians. And that comes into a different concept that we should really talk about Alistair, I think, which is that, that responsibility or right to protect doctrine that arose, particularly in the last five years. Yeah, so there are two issues we really want to look at here. The first is this idea of how far it's, how far you can go to create a space to facilitate peace processes and to what lengths you'll, you can go while still preserving neutrality. And there's sort of two extremes of this uh, that we're going to look at throughout this episode. Peacekeeping, which is where you go in to an existing ceasefire arrangement after hostilities have, have ceased, or and this comes in fact direct from the, the newest sort of UN peacekeeping manual, the idea of peace enforcement, which occurs sort of, can occur during a conflict even, and whether once you start sort of intervening in a conflict directly before peace processes are engaged in, and enforce a peace, whether you can maintain that neutrality and the UN sort of prime directive, if you like, of respecting the sovereignty of its member states. The second thing we want to look at is, is responsibility to protect, of course, and this is an idea that stems from particularly more recent conflicts where UN peacekeeping forces were unable to, due to their rules of engagement and their mandates, unable to protect the civilians in the area they were in. So, like you said, the first generation of peacekeepers were pretty lightly armed, if at all, but if they were armed at all, and their observers often uh, placed between hostile forces, sort of as a, a like a physical block. So, a good example of this would be the first one of the first true deployments of military peacekeepers, 
which was the United Nations Emergency Force, uh, which was deployed in reaction to the Suez Crisis. Uh, they were deployed along inside Egyptian territory with Egyptian consent. The Israelis did not give consent for peacekeepers to be deployed in their territory. And their mandate was to supervise the withdrawal of non-Egyptian forces along the Suez Canal and observe and ensure that the other terms of the uh, peaceful resolution of the conflict were maintained. That was the extent of their mandate. They, they had no provision to engage in anything beyond observation and they were uh, operating there purely under the consent of the Egyptian government. And this is the pattern that a lot of these early missions followed. Egypt serves as a really good example to some of the flaws in this system, though, because just days before the Six-Day War occurs, uh, Egypt renounces this permission and, and kicks the United Nations out. And then what follows, of course, is the Six-Day War, and then a few, a few years later, the Yom Kippur War, um, after which the new United Nations Emergency Force, UNEF-2, is deployed with a very similar mandate. So you can see how respecting state sovereignty and operating in, with permission is a little bit problematic, because once someone wants to actually go to war again, they can just kick you out. Absolutely, and you can certainly see that we get a, we get a shift here. And the shift really comes um, in the early 90s when you start to see the, the first uh, UN-backed interventions into Somalia, which, of course, led to the Battle of Mogadishu, and everyone's seen the movie that came out of that. Um, but also, if you compare this to some of, at the height of that transition, you had operations occur like Interfed, which was effectively a UN-sanctioned invasion of East Timor in order to establish peace, in order to stop a conflict that was occurring. Now, you can certainly see the distinction there between what we have in this case, which is very lightly armed, effectively observers who attempt to stop war simply by standing in the middle of it. And at, it, at, the, at its height, the concept of peace enforcement, when everyone was riding this very heady wave of responsibility to protect and you know, force post the Rwandan genocide and that tragedy, you can see the distinction here when Australia led a multinational force into Timor that was effectively designed to invade, establish dominance, and then allow a peaceful reconstruction to occur. As you just said, um, this is an idea that, that came out of the um, aftermath of, of the Rwanda and also the, and I'm going to mispronounce this horribly, but the Srebrenica massacres in Bosnia. Both of these are instances where peacekeepers, for slightly different reasons, were unable to protect an absolute massacre, genocide in, in, in the case of Rwanda, for, you know, as I said, different reasons. In Rwanda, peacekeepers were faced with restrictive uh, rules of engagement, um, and local commanders were a bit confused as to what lengths they were authorized to use force to protect the people involved. Whereas in Bosnia, uh, Dutch peacekeepers, predominantly Dutch peacekeepers, had sort of been surrounded and, and, and starved out by uh, Serbian forces until they were effectively a reduced fighting force and unable to defend themselves, let alone the group involved there. So out of that we get a, a massive outcry, really, in the international sphere and the form, formation of this idea that sovereign states, despite being in the UN Charter and under the normal institutions of international law and norms, entirely responsible and entirely autonomous in their internal workings, that there was actually an inherent responsibility to protect the citizens therein. And when this demonstrably failed, as in the case of Rwanda and Srebrenica and, and in others since, that the international community had not just a right but an obligation to intervene. Absolutely. And it, I think it's worth actually pausing for a second there to, to emphasize that. Humanitarian intervention in its earliest stages was based on the concept that a state has a right to intervene. And this is this goes beyond that, goes a step further. What it's arguing is states have an obligation to use their resources and power, both in soft and hard forms, to protect the underlying human rights and basic standards that we have built what we see as international society on. And that becomes a responsibility that they are then held to under R2P. So it's no longer a positive um, standard that must be met 
what it is is a responsibility, a requirement for states ethically and, you know, normative to intervene where it's apparent that a, st- a state has failed in the obligations that it owes its citizens. Yeah, and I have a quote here from the then Secretary General Kofi Annan, who was Secretary General during both Rwandan genocide and the, and the Bosnian massacres. If humanitarian intervention is indeed an unacceptable assault on sovereignty, how are we resp- to respond to a Rwanda to gross and systematic violations of human rights that affect every precept of our common humanity. This is what the R2P in its legal form is sort of predicated on. Firstly, that it requires a just cause, that there there must be sort of a, uh, there must be a serious and irreparable harm occurring or immediately, uh, imminently likely to occur. The intention of the action, particularly military action, must be purely to prevent human suffering and, and provide human security. It must be a last resort i.e. that you know, diplomatic and other act- actions had already been uh, taken or would be more likely to fail. It must be proportional to the crisis. It must have a reasonable prospect of a success. That's not just that it won't make the situation necessarily worse, but also that the mission is scaled in such a way that it is um, be successful. And, and this is the real clincher on this, as with every deployment, it must be authorized by the Security Council, which is some of the more delicate international politics has played into this. Because there have been countless examples of things where people have argued whether or not R2P should be enacted, and in the end it hasn't because of that, because of that, especially because of the veto powers inherent within the Security Council. So the, the real difference in practical terms is that the resolution comes can come after the beginning of the operation, as opposed to peacekeeping when it has to be before. Now, Alistair mentioned, of course, the veto power being a problem. I mean, even today, we saw Russia and China veto a Security Council resolution that would have imposed quite limited sanctions on members of the Syrian government in response to the ongoing civil war. And that is the civil war in Syria is one of the loudest arguments that are currently going on about whether R2P applies. And if sanctions aren't even able to be imposed without a veto power being used, then you can see how it would be incredibly difficult in a contested environment to authorise any peacekeeping operation because the powers are that be, so to speak, are at play there, whereas responsibility to protect devolves us from that internationalist outlook and allows a state to stand up and actually abide by its ethical and, in terms of international law, normative requirements that it intervene when it is justifiable to do so without the internationalist response. I think you can't possibly argue that there isn't a case to be made that Syria, in its current state in civil war, has abjectively failed to protect its citizens. That's, that's not an argument. But then the follow-up to that, what you, what you do and how you do that, uh, how, what you do to protect the civilians and what, what, how you go into that situation becomes a new point of contention. And it would be naive to think that geopolitics don't play a role in the effectiveness of R2P instigated um, interventions, because of course they will, they always will. And to date, it has been the Western powers or the leading developing powers that have exercised their responsibility to protect in order to justify military intervention. And this is for a couple of reasons. The most practical being that they're the only ones that really have the resources and um, prestige as individual states to actually conduct that operation. What I think that R2P really brings to the table is if we can develop it as a meaningful international law norm in such a way that allows it to be implemented more effectively and allows it to be integrated more effectively into how states conduct policy responses, places like Africa, and we've talked about the African Union, Places like Africa with the African Union, regional security bodies could actually take up their responsibility under R2P and legitimately intervene in regional issues where their neighbouring states are failing their citizens in a way that doesn't deal on the large global scale geopolitics in the same way that does whenever a major power invokes R2P. I guess, though, there, there is always the question in people's minds, and it's very hard to get a very clear perspective on this, 
because of course when we're dealing with these issues particularly around responsibility to protect and its invocation which is always in the most desperate of and 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 often violent of circumstances that it's very easy to get caught up in the moment i mean the whole policy was formulated in the in the wake of two absolute atrocities and so for example after libya the internet a lot of the international community triumphed that as sort of the new age of r2p and now all of a sudden with syria when it's not happening in the same way and the way that conflict is being conducted is, is in, on the international level is very different um this you're starting to hear murmurings of maybe it's the death of r2p now neither of those two perspectives really have the sort of scope to actually answer that question where are we going with this and is it strengthening or weakening and that's partially because these become such political and emotive issues i mean it's high politics it's the great game of grand diplomacy and the highly emotive issue of of loss and human suffering on grand scales it's very hard to take a step back and see where it, it's really going without serious time and study this sort of peace enforcement's not terribly new though i mean if anything it's sort of a, a return to an idea that was pretty thoroughly squashed in the aftermath of uh, the first UN deployment to the Congo just to give a bit of backdrop the southern congolese province of katanga that southern province had seceded from the newly independent Congo uh, due to a whole bunch of uh, civil strife that had arrived, occurred during its the independence movement there uh, but with the support of its previous belgian colonial government and with support of belgian uh, mercenaries the united nations were called in to sort of oversee the peace process and to prevent civil war during which a number of operations designed to arrest and sort of preemptively defend the peace process and prevent civil war by arresting mercenaries were planned and the first one went off really well and 80 or so mercenaries were captured and and successfully escorted out of the country but the second one because it lacked surprise and because the writing was starting to come on the war for the Katangan independence movement uh, it was met with violence and what's what it occurred was a sort of an outbreak almost of a war between Katanga and the United Nations and it wasn't until January in 1963 that progressively more aggressive UN operations finally suppressed the Katangan and foreign um, military forces uh, and was most definitely a, an escalation of violence beyond what we consider normally a um the mandate of a of a peacekeeping operation if you look at this particular conflict you can certainly see why un peacekeepers aren't historically willing to engage in such operations where the stated objective is a military one now unlike your regional peacekeeping or security bodies like asean a the african union etc though the the UN has to rely on voluntary contributions of troops and a level of funding from its member organizations. And this means that quite often it's difficult, particularly with unpopular or with potentially violent missions, into places like the DRC, which is a continuing UN mission, for them to gain troops. Now, there's obviously two types of troops, and we'll go into this a little bit later, but it is quite difficult for the UN to secure well-armed, well-equipped Western soldiers for these peacekeeping operations, particularly ones that are violent and ongoing. And the UN mission in Somalia, which has been taken over by the African Union, is a clear example of this. And that's why, at least in my opinion, we have these series of swings into peace enforcement, which are then rapidly dragged back into your very low-key peacekeeping before they go back and get expeditionary again. So just to look at a short history of, of uh, Somalia for a second, that was initially a peacekeeping mission that, this is UNISOM 1, was initially a peacekeeping mission in a very traditional sense to maintain a, a ceasefire arrangement. But when the conflict there started escalating, particularly when re rebel groups in that civil war started fragmenting into much smaller ones and harder to control, the whole idea of a peacekeeping force was almost sort of removed unisom one's uh, position was supplanted by a u.n authorized but u.s led united task force it wasn't even truly under the banner of the united nations it was under direct u.s uh, control and they contributed 28 out of the 39,000 personnel on the ground and they defined their mandate to provide security for the provision of aid 
by any means necessary. So security in those, you know, in those terms is quite military. It's, it's holding open roads. It's making sure convoys get where they need to go. And although that period's mel- relatively peaceful, when the United Task Force considered its mission complete and withdrew in 1993, that's when things really started spiraling out of control. And that's when we start getting the lead up to uh, the Battle of Mogadishu. And- Again, while we're on the topic of Somalia, Somalia is, is widely considered to be the most unstable state in existence. And Somalia also gives us a clear example of what happens when an independent state decides to take its own action for its own reasons, independent of regional peacekeeping operations that are occurring in a state. So an example we get from Somalia is 2006 Ethiopian invasion, which occurred while the internationally supported transitional federal government was attempting to retake control of the country supported by the African Union mission in Somalia. Now, the Ethiopian invasion was exactly that. It was an independent invasion by the Ethiopians into Somalia based on long-standing grievances, but also to protect their own interests from a resurgent Eritrea and from inter- intervention by Al-Shabaab-sponsored militants that were fleeing or attempting to consolidate power in their region because most of Ethiopia borders on Somalia. Now, what's interesting here is after they were forced to withdraw in 2008 following a, a basically being sucked into the ongoing insurgency. They then rejoined the African mission, African Union mission, and have become its chief contributor of manpower. So their second incursion into Somalia, much more recently, has now been legitimised under the cover of peacekeeping, whereas their first mission was widely condemned by everyone except the US who was sponsoring them. The sort of the robes of legitimacy are shaped by um, terminology and, and stated mission, but has has much changed? And at what point do you sort of start looking at this and, and, and asking asking questions of the motivations? That's the exact question you've got to ask, Alistair, is at what point does independent state action become robed in these, as you say, robes of legitimacy? And the elephant in the room with this that should be addressed going back the other direction is the Korean War, which I'd say is that that time the UN really did kind of unequivocally go to war. Except did they? This is an interesting question, because, I mean, uh, the conduct of the, the Western forces, the United Nations forces in uh, the Korean War was under the mandate of uh, resolutions uh, 83 and 84. 83 recommended that member parties provide assistance to repel the armed attack of the North and North Korea and to restore international peace and security in the area. And Resolution 84 placed those forces under a unif- unified command of the United States. So is this a, was this the first war of the United Nations or is this, again, the cloak of legitimacy? No, I think with the Korean War, you have to look at it in its full context. Now, had the Korean War occurred and the North was being supported by, say, the UK, um, I certainly don't think there would have been the level of pressure there was on the UN to um, pass those resolutions. However, despite that fact, what we had was a war of, the South Koreans would argue, unprovoked intent that was simply an invasion. Now, that is against international law. Even black and white treaty-bound international law, it's a clear violation. And therefore, the international community has a responsibility to react. Now, in this case, it was unequivocally a war. I would certainly argue strongly against any interpretation of the Korean War as anything but. Whether it was conducted for the enforcement of world peace, as it says, or quite simply as the Koreans, the South Koreans saw it for their very survival. And make no mistake, for a long time there, it was a war for their very survival. Um, There was a large period of the Korean War where the South Koreans looked like they were going to lose. To them, it doesn't matter what the UN justification for that conflict was. For them, it was a war that was forced on them by larger geopolitical factors and one that became about their very survival. And for the United States, as another perspective, uh, it was the the beginnings of the domino theory and and checking the the sort of the rise of communism in, in Asia. It's also worth noting that the only reason, going back to what you're saying, the only reason those resolutions were passed in the United Nations was that the Soviet Union 
as a permanent member of the Security Council, was actually boycotting the proceedings uh, due to the continued recognition of the government in exile of China as the sitting member on the Security Council, rather than the People's Republic of China. So there's another sort of point of how the UN got involved there is as, as, as much to do with the um, Soviet Union's absence and then subsequent support of, of, the, of North Korea as it is to do with anything else. Now, we were talking before about the, the rise and, f and fall of, of, of peace enforcement versus peacekeeping, but is there a distinction here between peace enforcement and war? I mean, certainly we can look at different countries and their actions and involvements and motivations in peacekeeping or peacekeeping and, or peace enforcement operations. But where's this line? Is this a not war? Or do we broaden our definition and, and go back to the idea that we are putting forward a policy that is enforcing peace um, through means other than pure diplomacy? I think it's one of those things that depends on the exact version of what we're talking about. Um, in particular, what we have to look at here is the wider context for those interventions. Now, the UN, as distinct from more regional bodies, which we'll talk about in a second, is really hampered by the international politics here. And they are quite poor at going into a conflict because it's a multinational organization that lacks any real enforcement power. Now, it's not to the same extent as its predecessor, the League of Nations, but still, this organization that was created to enforce world peace or to create the conditions for world peace certainly lacks the ability to enforce it. And at the moment, what we're seeing is peacekeeping as the, the stopgap measure, the half measure. Now, whether that raises to the equivalency of being a war, in you know quotation marks, depends on the actual mission we're talking about in particular. But overall, I think it would be hard to argue that the UN could function at its peak with its current resourcing and enforcement capabilities. It certainly requires more to do its job properly. I just have a, a quote here from uh, Doyle and Sambanis, who have written on this uh, quite comprehensively and have a very good book, uh, Making War and Building Peace, about this. And they say that, the UN is very poor at war, that is, sort of imposing a settlement by force, but it can be very good at peace, mediating and implementing a comprehensive pre-negotiated peace. And I think if you look at the first deployment to Congo um, and the operations conducted there against the uh, Kentungan independence, which has got an excellent side, side movie on Netflix, by the way, um, The Siege of Yadotville, which is worth exploring. And if you look at Somalia and the Battle of Mogadishu, in both cases, you have um, a UN peacekeeping force effectively exceeding its sort of unwritten objective um, to try and force through a process, and I would say in that violating its own neutrality. But there are plenty of examples where the UN has facilitated a space for peace, pre-negotiated peace, to th grow in the backdrop of um, sort of a a respected observer, and it's, it's when we start crossing that line, I think, that, that some of the biggest uh, problems with in regards to the United Nations um, begin to occur. But I would argue that those problems are only arising from the fact that the United Nations is a half measure. You know, the United Nations peacekeeping operations do create good change, but there is certainly a school of thought, and, you know, in terms of, to bring you back to some theory, it would be your uh, either your neoliberalist or your offensive neoliberalist schools that would argue this, if the UN was able to force or rely upon contributions or have its own standing force for a response, then we wouldn't be having this discussion because we could create a narrative of legitimacy around UN armed intervention if it was something that occurred with reasonable regularity and on the basis of a defined set of criteria. What happens now is there are 101 tragedies that are occurring around the world, and the UN is only able to respond to two or three at a time, constrained by political and economic restraints. But that in itself creates its own issues. Like you say, if, uh, you're able to construct a legitimacy for prosecuting conflict, but I think, personally, I think that's when we start stepping over the line of, of peacekeeping and, and peace enforcement and start 
uh, walking into the old adage of uh, fighting for peace is, is like screwing for virginity. It just doesn't work. <laughs> Whereas if you have something that is constrained by those politics, and while it is constrained in that way, both institutionally and in politically, you have a much better chance that, although perhaps your resources are more limited, a much better chance that the intentions of the organization are communicated more um, more clearly. I would certainly agree with you on that point. But I do think, I mean, Theodore Roosevelt famously said, you know, talk softly and carry a big stick. And unfortunately, the UN doesn't have its own big stick. So all it does is talk softly. And that has created, to an extent, an effective response criteria. And it is worth mentioning that if we were to adopt a more robust, to use the internationally acceptable term, UN response regime, we'd have to put up with mounting casualties. That's just a fact. And unfortunately, what we're dealing with is we're dealing with people and we're dealing with states and they all have their own reasons and their own motivations. And so, unfortunately, while a UN mission might be hard enough already to get off the ground, it's much harder to justify, to source and to arm when that UN mission is going into conflict zone or starts to suffer casualties. And so that would have to be taken into account. On that point, however, it's interesting to note that particularly over the last 10 years, we've seen a decrease in troop commitments, very gradual, um, of the Western states and a corresponding but definitely sharper increase in the amount of troops available from third world states, particularly in Africa, but also in the Pacific. Now, there are, of course, domestic political consequences to the fact that the UN is paying for these military personnel for countries that would otherwise not be able to afford them. Certain former militia members have ended up on government payroll by this manner. But what it does let us do is have boots on the ground that know the environment in those regions, and that's a good thing. And particularly with the advent of remote-operated technology, the classic drone, for example, we've seen the ability for states in the West to agree to provide support arms to predominantly third world soldiers on UN peace enforcement missions, where they don't risk their own personnel, but they do provide advanced technology. Now, if we could perfect that, we'd certainly have a better UN moving forward, a more effective one. I think part of that, though, is also that you're getting cross uh, or international cooperation inside these areas where often you have competing or disparate interests. I mean, you mentioned Ethiopia before and, and its involvement in Somalia, but I guess one of the advantages of bringing these different nations together under a UN banner or under a regional banner like the African Union is it does, by hook or by crook, kind of promote this, this liberalist ideal of cooperation. I mean, inevitably you do what you wind up with is a multinational force cooperating towards a single goal, and the effects might be slight, but I think that that, that can't help but promote a uh, a stronger sense of some kind of unity, at the very least temporarily. I think the African Union is a really good example of this. Absolutely. The African Union, I would certainly argue, is the most obvious example of Africa as a continent coming together. What we've seen in the last two decades is an Africa that is rapidly increasing its economic power and is accepting investment, particularly from China. And this is one of those things that I like to talk about. China is investing heavily in Africa, particularly sub-Saharan Africa. Now, this is for both good and geopolitically bad reasons, but the point is what we're having here is the typical powerhouse states in the continent, South Africa and Nigeria, have started to drop off in their level of commitment of peacekeeping soldiers to the UN and to the African Union missions that are occurring around the continent at any given time. Now, there are different reasons for this. However, the point is that two of the most traditionally military powerful and stable actors in the region are no longer contributing to the same extent. Now, into that gap, what we've really seen is other states stepping up. And I think, you know, as naive as it sounds, that's certainly a good example of this real self-determination that we see if we look at through a post-colonial security studies viewpoint. We see countries like Uganda and Kenya taking leadership and Ethiopia as well 
in the fight against Al Shabaab in Somalia. And Uganda and Kenya have suffered for that fight. But with only US support, and to a large extent, they're still being trained and supported by the US, these countries have really, stu- they've really stood up. And aside from economic cooperation and medical cooperation in the case of the um, Ebola outbreak two years ago, we're finally seeing the African Union start to step up, I think. Now, there's certainly some issues here that still have not been addressed. African Union peacekeepers, for example, are typically woefully, woefully under-equipped compared to their UN counterparts or their Western counterparts, and more importantly, to the people they're fighting. Now, over the last three or four years, they've been trained quite extensively by US and European advisors who have also contributed things like drone strikes um, to their efforts in order to try and bolster that. And it really provides an example of that hybrid program I was talking about for the UN moving forward. And thankfully, we're starting to see the African Union become more professionalized as we go on. One of the things, and the last thing I really talk about here before I let Alistair get a word in, is that the African Union is really taking a step forward here in that they're finally putting the final touches, regional security force, which would be a standby force that was available to be deployed anywhere on the continent at a very short notice under a single command. And that would vastly increase their ability to successfully intervene in the early stages of conflict where peace can still be achieved with low cost. I think that's a real key differential here between the regional partners, partnerships like the AU, and your more international partnerships, which are, you know, reliant on powerful states to provide funding like the UN. I think this also highlights sort of the change when you look at how uh, power politics is played too. In the African Union, uh, the operations are authorized by their Peace and Security Council, which is comprised of 15 members, none of whom have a permanent status or veto, unlike the Security Council. So it's a really different body. The United Nations Security Council is basically made up of what would be traditionally considered the victors of the Second World War, and also the nuclear powers, both being more or less the same thing. And that political game is still played. If you look at the United Nations operations in, in Africa in the 60s, if you look at United Nations operations, and more importantly, the ones that get vetoed in the Middle East, it's being played to a very old game. Whereas when you're looking at, in, in Africa particularly, there are certainly those, there are certainly regional power politics being played, but the removal of those sort of key elements of permanent veto members and a larger number of members more vested in security, because insecurity in one state can so easily spread to another. It's sort of, I, I guess it makes the power politics a little bit more fair. And a key thing we're seeing here is the African Union, unlike the UN, is willing to take a more strong stance on internal security issues of its member states. The UN is a very realist organisation for such a multinational organisation. It operates in a very realist manner. They refuse, in in the case of its larger funders or more powerful member states, to intervene meaningfully in their internal politics. Take Russia, for example, where internal political dissidents disappear all the time. Same with China. This is normal. In Africa, however... You have strong condemnation occurring when dictators, and to be fair, dictatorship is still the norm in Africa. Large swathes of Africa, they still have dictators and that's considered okay. But the African Union has taken a strong stance on condemning member states when their leaders refuse to step down or threaten to refuse to step down after elections. It's exactly for that reason that Alistair mentioned, is to prevent inter-regional instability. But unlike the UN, the AU is able to bring together regional pressures and, importantly, they are not afraid to send in troops to enforce their will. And because there are no permanent members on that body, it really is the continent speaking up for itself. Now, I'm not naive and I realise that there are strongly entrenched commercial and other political regional powers at work here. We're certainly talking about not talking about a fair organisation. What we are talking about is a much more proactive organisation. And I really think that the UN, if it was ever able to, could take a key lesson from the African Union in this point. See, I disagree on that. I would say that the, particularly the points you're talking about here, proactive action um, and the formation of uh, ready forces, it would be 
uh, an absolute dearth to the to the United Nations. And I think if you look at its actions in Somalia, when it, um, and particularly um, Unisom 2, and it's the where the U.S. was still taking a very leading role, and if you look at um, Congo in the 1960s, when it's engaged in aggressive or robust peace enforcement operations, it's typically created much more instability than it's solved. And I think that a lot of things are playing into that. Like you said, contribution of, of forces to the peacekeeping missions is very variable. One of the problems you saw with Somalia was, um, in the wake, particularly in the wake of the Battle of Mogadishu, an absolute freefall of support domestically in the US because American soldiers were dying, and so you saw a withdrawal of our boys from a fight that isn't ours. And also in, in Congo, of course, you saw um, the influence of resource conflicts and also more directly of, of a sort of international embarrassment that this was not the UN's place to, to wage a war. But nonetheless, I think that these, these sort of robust approaches, when undertaken by the UN, I mean, I think they really do tread on a fairly fragile institutional understanding of, of what that sort of world power really is that you don't get in regional affairs. No, I take your point there, Alistair. And I think that it's one of those things where if in an ideal world, my point would be accurate. But equally, I think that we can't discount the role played by peace enforcement operations. And by peace enforcement, I have to clarify here, what I mean is forces going in to a conflict at its beginning stages or at its end stages, not in the middle of it, and forcibly protecting civilians and the democratic peace process or negotiations to take place, right? I don't think that we should allow the fact that we still don't in the West know how to effectively conduct post-war nation building to stop us from doing that. I think the responsibility to protect as, as a concept is vastly important. As a doctrine, it needs some work, but I think the concept needs to be respected, particularly at a regional organization level like the African Union. Yeah, I think the ideal is what drives all of this, and uh, this is this is sort of what I'm getting at with the, with the ideal of the United Nations and its r respect for sovereignty. Um, but I think that perhaps... Given its history, that is the role best played by regional actors with support where at all possible. The other point you make about being involved in the conflict at the start or the end, I, I totally agree with. I think when you start diving into the middle, that is not a peace operation enforcement or otherwise. That is that is going to war. You, you can't preserve any pretext to neutrality at all. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, the, the International Committee of the Red Cross and other fantastic aid organizations that risk their lives to bring aid to civilians do operate in those environments. They operate in the middle of conflict zones. And ideally what we'd see with peace enforcement is the creation of safe zones for civilians. If there had to be an intervention in the middle of a war, then it should be constrained and it should be based on the concept of creating safe zones that work, unlike in Rwanda and to a lesser extent Yugoslavia. Now, I do think, though, that you have to realise here that, and not you, but figuratively, that regional bodies are only capable of operating to the level that their resourcing allows. So the African Union, for example, has crippling equipment shortages and training issues with its troops. And their troops are of varying quality and combat readiness. And so you have things happen like a 20-man patrol in the DRC will just disappear. And its rescue team of 20 dudes will also just disappear. Now, the reason for that is that they were completely outgunned by a Johnny on the spot rebel who was able to get their tools on the black market. Now, this wouldn't happen to a Western force. And so I think the UN perhaps needs to reorientate itself. And this is a bit radical, but I'm going to go there. I think the UN needs to get out of the process of having peace enforcement and have wars, per se. Clearly, your regional forces have more success on the ground, which is historically we've seen it. Now, what the UN should be doing is linking those regional forces 
with its own peacekeeping abilities, with its own peacekeeping forces, in order to upgrade them. Gives them the tools and the equipment they need to persecute these peace enforcement conflicts, and they are conflicts, certainly argue they are wars at a certain point, to an effective manner. We should be providing the training, the, the resources and the equipment they need to dominate that battle space when they go in. Because otherwise what happens is all they're doing is contributing to an ongoing conflict, like we're seeing in Somalia. Yeah, I think the key here, though, is the beginning or the end. You can't intervene once once it really starts lighting up. That starts to that will completely undermine any presumption of neutrality. But I guess this sort of answers our second question: Is it possible to fight for peace without screwing for virginity? And I think what we're talking about here is is, is the use of force to provide a negative security space. That is, the absence of gunshots and death. But that's only part of the process. What follows on from there, the, the peace building and nation building processes, uh, is a whole nother story for a whole nother episode. Well, that's much more than we have time for tonight. We hope you've enjoyed the more vibrant discussion of this episode, and if you have, why not consider supporting us through Patreon? For as little as the price of a cup of coffee per episode, you can help cover our hosting fees, as well as contributing to recording equipment and source material that will help us improve the show for you. As always, though, the best and simplest way you can support us is to share this podcast with anyone, students, or colleagues, or friends you think might enjoy it. There's so many sides to this and the other issues we discuss, and the only way that we improve our understanding of them is to share our thoughts and ideas. As always, if you want further reading or would like to send us your thoughts, please visit our blog at www.onwarthepodcast.wordpress.com or follow the links in the description below. Next week, we'll continue this series with a look at insurgency, arguably the definition of the new way of war. Once again, thank you for listening, and good night.